everyone. Good evening. A lot of you watching the replay have been really super cool about putting it into the comment section for me lately, and I really appreciate that. So welcome to Cozy Talks. If you're watching the replay, uh, please throw that into the comment section. You can say hashtag replay or uh, I'm watching the replay or whatever. And if you want to put your questions in, go ahead, guys. I do go back and I review uh, the previous live streams so that I can catch any questions for those of you who weren't able to make it to the live show. So I see some folks popping on board. Guys, this evening, don't be shy. Let me know who you are, where you're from, and what is in your Cool Kids Cozy Talks mug. How many of my cool kids are out there? I've been, uh, I brought these back onto my website and also the, uh, I don't have one with me, the Cozy Talks uh, beer glasses, and those have been selling pretty nicely. You guys are really helping me out with that, and I appreciate that. Hey, Harsh, cheers, how are you? Mm. Okay, nothing like a nice fresh pot of decaf. Hey, William Mays, what's going on? We got Barbara on board. Hey, Barbara, we got Christina. Hey, guys, welcome on board. Don't be shy. We got quite a quite a crew popping on board right now this evening. We got lots of questions for tonight, which always makes me very happy. Hey, looky, looky, it's Mark S. Hey, Kenny, uh, in the beach in Virginia Beach, Virginia Beach, Virginia. There you go, Kenny. I've got your question right here, so stick around. Bonnie, she is drinking coffee out of her Cozy Talks mug. Bonnie, cheers to you. How many of y'all out there got a cool kid mug? I want to see who are all my cool kids out there. All right, guys. And yes, I have them restocked on the website. I've got the mug and I've got the beer glasses, but they are kind of flying off the shelves a little bit. So get yours while you can. Hey there, Patrick, Michelle, Daryl out there with his iced tea. Robin, oh, you made it, Robin. I'm so happy when you can make it, Robin. I appreciate it because I know you have very long days on Wednesdays. So I really appreciate you coming. Hey, Lonnie, Lonnie, you're back. Oh man, it's good to see you again. We haven't had you here in a couple weeks. I know you've had some stuff to deal with, so I'm glad you're here. Kay, how you doing? From sunny Alaska in the garden, weeding my giant dandelions. You're not supposed to weed those, Kay. You're supposed to blow on those dandelions and make wishes. We got Dick Devers, Love BK, West Virginia, cold spring water. Uh, let's see. Patrick says, Peroni after 12-hour cardiopulmonary rehab. Ugh. That's a shift and a half. Patrick is one of my fellow physical therapists up in New York. Uh, yes, Bob is looking rather dapper tonight. You can tell my kids got a hold of Bob and they gave him a little bit of a makeover. He, he's all, you know, fancy tonight. Uh, Benny there drinking his tea. Benny watching me for my YouTube channel. I always forget to say this, guys. I am broadcasting to my YouTube channel. So there's some folks out there that have a tough time sometimes finding me on Facebook. So if you know of anybody who's trying to watch the show, send them to my YouTube channel. It might be a little bit easier for them to tune in. Johnny V, how you doing with your uh, all your sports that you're doing, Johnny? I can't keep up with you, man. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we got a lot of people on board. So guys, we're going to go ahead and get started this evening. Feel free to post your questions in the comments section, and I will definitely be getting to them. So for those of you who are joining me for the first time, welcome. My name is Crosi Belloso. I'm a physical therapist, amputee specialist here in Tampa, Florida. I've been a PT now for a little over 18 years, and my passion is is working with the limb loss community. I do have a clinic here in Tampa that is exclusively for working with amputees and teaching folks how to use their prosthesis and all that kind of good stuff. And those of you who've been with me for a little while, you know, I've been working on this super top secret project that basically it's it's been two years now that I've been working on this project. And I am hopefully going to launch it towards the end of summer. So if my eyes look a little bugged out this evening, it's because I've been <laughs> staring at lots of computer screens and trying to get all the parts of the project to finally come together. And I am so looking forward to finally soon be able to share this with you guys. Hey, Doug, record breaking heat for the last 10 days in Alberta. Holy smokes, pools are opening. Yay. Oh my gosh. So swimming for the first time as a bilateral suggestions on this. So Doug, this has been obviously a hot topic for the past couple of weeks on the show, because obviously a lot of the places now are open for, for swimming and for the pool and for the beach here in Florida. It's a year round sport for us, right? how we can get to the beach. Um, so Doug, usually one of the first things I, add, I tell people when they're going to the beach or the pool for the first time is practice. Practice and think of your strategy of how you're going to get to the edge of the pool, how you're gonna get in and how you're gonna get out. And I know it sounds like, well, duh, Cozy, master of the obvious, but a lot of times folks will just get to a place and they don't have a plan, they don't have a strategy. 
So Doug, in the pool, and again, I don't know how things are in Canada compared to here in the United States, but I know here in the United States, pools are required to have some sort of lift device that can lower the person into the pool, some sort of accessibility into the pool area. So call ahead of time, Doug. I used to do lifeguarding for many years, and I know I would get occasional phone calls from folks who needed the use of that chair and they wanted to make sure it was working. If there is no chair, ask the lifeguards, you know, what kind of disability access do they have into the pool? Do they have railings that you can slowly walk into with your prosthetic devices, provided that you're able to get into the water with your particular feet, Doug? Uh, the next thing, getting up and down off the floor. Okay, that's a skill that is really scary, especially when you're an, a newer amputee to do but it is an incredibly valuable skill for many reasons. And one of those reasons is because it allows you to get obviously down onto the ground um, at the edge of the pool and then being able to slip into the pool that way. Okay, so Doug, that's something you might wanna consider, especially if you have a physical therapist who can kind of work with you and figure out a technique that works for you on how to go from floor to standing and back down again. Another option, Doug, and this is something that for my bilaterals, I do like to kind of try out because obviously things are a little bit different for you. Um, if you have a wheelchair, okay, you can approach the pool side in your wheelchair and go straight into the pool that way. Or when you're getting out of the pool, lift yourself up onto the edge of the pool side and then lift yourself up into the wheelchair. Now that does require a lot of shoulder strength, a lot of arm strength, okay? And when I'm in my clinic, the, kind, the, the few times I've had bilaterals that were capable of doing this particular skill, we did have to work on some arm strength and shoulder strength and back strength to kind of help them be able to really hoist up their weight so that they could go all the way up into their wheelchair. But it is possible, Doug. So my best advice for you would be plan a strategy. Call ahead bring a friend, think about how you're going to get to the pool, who's going to be holding your devices, who's going to be helping you, maybe who's not going to be helping you. Doug, I know you're an extremely active individual, so I would think maybe that you could put on Okay, looks like I'm back. Sorry, guys. Yep, it, it, my computer, it just said the connection was like, ah, dead. So little, little note about Florida. Here in the summertime, we have massive thunderstorms like every day. I'm not exaggerating. And right now it's like black as night out, not because it's nighttime, but because we have thunderclouds. So I'm sure my internet connection is, <laughs> no, hopefully I'm back. Guys, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see me again? Can y'all see me again? Thumbs up. Yes. No. Maybe so. Can y'all see me again? Okay, good. Yes. Now you can see me. Great. Thank you guys. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay, awesome. Okay, sorry, a little bit of a time delay from when you guys type in the messages and then I get the messages back. So anyways, as I was saying, Doug, I know you're an extremely active individual. So I think for you, it might be that you might, if, if you're, ask, clear this with your prosthetist first, if you can take your legs into the pool, walk yourself into the pool using the stairs and the railing, right? And then you can either remove your legs and leave them at the side of the pool and then when it's time to get back out again, sit yourself on one of those stairs, right? Dry yourself off, put your legs on, and then walk yourself out of the pool. So it sounds a little complicated, but what I've seen is when folks just practice and practice, they figure out a rhythm that works for them. The guys, for us, you know, uh, beach and pool and water life and salt life, as they call it around here, is it's, it's part of quality of life here for us as Floridians. And that for me is something important. You know, this is one of those things that you need to get back to. You need to figure out how you can do it. Not if you can do it, how you can do it.
how you can do it within reason. All right. So we got a few more people here. Just, oh, Justine's here. Justine, I'm going to tackle your question first because I'm having a couple of, you know, I'm, I'm starting to see more and more clinicians come on the show. And I love this. I love having the support of my fellow clinicians. I love getting their viewpoints on things. So Justine, this is one's for you. Justine asked, I wanted to ask you what kind of continuing education courses you have done. I've been try having trouble finding CEU courses for limb loss, rehab, prosthetics, orthotics, and anything related. Do you have any tips? So guys, uh, those of you who have any kind of medical or healthcare license, you know that in order to maintain your license, you have to take what's called continuing education units, courses, and we call them CEUs. And depending on which state you are licensed will determine how many credits you need to do. So in my case, I'm a physical therapist licensed here in Florida, and every two years I have to renew my license. And in order to renew my license, I have to take the equivalent of 24 continuing education credits, okay? And this is usually for physical therapists. We usually, we like to go to courses where we learn manual techniques, where we learn uh, new things on surgical techniques, pharmacology, depending on your specialty. Unfortunately, there's not a lot out there for amputee uh, rehabilitation. There's not a lot out there for the physical therapist to learn about prosthetics and orthotics. It's, it's really, it's slim pickings, guys. Um, thankfully, and again, this is for any of my clinicians out there listening, specifically the physical therapists, because there's obviously a lot of continuing education courses for our prosthetists, not a whole lot for the physical therapy side of things. And this is something that I'm starting to see change in, and I'm really happy about it. Okay. So Mission Gate organization, and I'm going to type this in, and this is not just for my clinicians, guys. This is also for my entire limb loss community. Okay. Mission Gate organization is based out of Richmond, Virginia. And Robin, if you're still on board, if you don't mind throwing their link up there, that would be amazing. Okay. This organization was founded by a physical therapist and his mission is to help educate other professionals. So it's, it's, it's kind of the, you know, in a, in a nutshell who they are and they've been on my show. I've done some keynote speaking for them on some of their conferences, fantastic organization. Okay phenomenal YouTube channel, okay, where you can get a wealth of videos and knowledge. And again, not just for physical therapists and clinicians, but also for my amputees out there listening and wondering how they can get some more information, okay? But for my clinicians, this is a great place to start. And they are in the process of creating a certification, a gate certification. And I am like, first in line to take this course. Okay. Yes. I've been doing this for 18 plus years and I've taught little courses here and there, but guys, for me, I always want to keep learning. It's, it's kind of a pain in the neck to have to keep doing these continuing ed courses to keep up my license, but it, 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 you learn new things. This old dog can still learn new tricks. So mission gate organization is definitely something I would watch out for. The other thing, self-learning. Okay. A lot. I had, a, I had the benefit of having a phenomenal mentor who was beyond a guru in amputee physical therapy. And he taught me one-on-one -on -one for several years. And he's still my mentor. He sometimes still gets a phone call from me, even though the poor guy's retired right now. <laughs> he's trying to retire. Okay. But after I left Miami, after I left that hospital where my mentor was at, I had to take responsibility for my own continuing education with regards to amputee rehab and updates on prosthetic technology. And you'll find, guys, a lot of clinicians, we have to do a lot of that ourselves. So that being said, um, I still like a good old fashioned library. OK, and I, I was looking at my library today and I was kind of chuckling because I still have all of my books from grad school guys. I still have my anatomy books. I still have my musculoskeletal physiology, all that kind of books, my cardiac rehab, neuro rehab books. And I have them there because guess what? The human body hasn't changed in the past few, I don't know, millennia. <laughs> okay. So the pathologies that occur in the human body, you know, they're still the same as they were when I was in school 20 something years ago. Okay. And more importantly, guys, the internet is a wonderful place to find information but it's also very challenging sometimes to determine what information is accurate and what information is not. And if it's done by a reliable source. And I know that as a physical therapist, sometimes when I'm trying to search databases and things to find research articles, that can be a bit of a challenge. But I know that my medical healthcare textbooks, those are reliable sources of information. Okay. 
So for those clinicians out there who are just like, why am I keeping my textbooks around? Guys, those are wonderful references. Don't underestimate the power of, of just going back to the basics and having those textbooks there. Okay. Uh, one of my favorites, and I've collected quite a library. I'm looking at it right now and I'm like, whoo, that's a overloaded bookshelf. One of my favorites for any of my clinicians out there who are treating amputee patients, it's this one. It is the Atlas of Amputations and Limb Deficiencies. And anybody who's been in the amputee world treating patients for any amount of time will have heard of this book. It's actually a series of two books. It's on its, I don't know what edition, fourth edition. I have the fourth edition and I'm pretty sure there's, this is, uh, there's probably another edition after this. Guys, this is a wonderful, wonderful book. And for those of you who are not healthcare clinicians, but you just like to read, it's heavy reading. I'm not going to lie to you. It's not, you know, it's not casual reading, um, but it's fascinating. And it has everything in here from surgical techniques to rehab techniques to prosthetic considerations, everything, a lot of things in just that one series of book. And then I have like a whole fleet of books, but these are, these are my two top favorite ones. And this one, Care for the Combat Amputee. And that for me comes from a soft spot just because obviously my father was military um, and I love working with the veteran population. So this is a really very well done textbook and it contains a lot of great stuff in here. So for my clinicians out there that are wanting to learn more, um, get your continuing ed courses that you need to do, right? And then go learn on your own. Oh, there was another thing I had here. Ah, okay. The just... Oh, good heavens. The, um, don't you, I need more coffee. Uh, the journal put out by the American Orthopedic and Prosth Orthotics and Prosthetics Association. Can somebody help me out here? Um, their journal that they put out, I was actually reading through it today and it's in the garage. That's why I don't have it here with me because I was actually reading one of those articles. Um, having a peer reviewed journal. Okay, subscribing. The subscriptions can sometimes be a little bit expensive, but again, you can write that off as a business expense. It's worth it because it's, again, a great valid resource to obtain a peer reviewed journal that you know that the research articles that are in there have been examined left and right and through and through, and you can rely upon that information. I am a nerd, Patrick. I am. A nerd. I am I'm not even going to try to hide it. I, I've got a nerd flag and I wave it high. Okay. Um, let's see. Use the stairs. So going back to the question about the pool, Johnny says, I use the stairs to transfer into the pool after I take my leg off in the chair close by the edge. Okay. Kay says, as an occupational therapist, I get some credits through my prosthetist. They'll bring people up on all sorts of good topics. And that's true. Sometimes, you know, and guys, you know, as a physical therapist, I will sometimes take the prosthetist courses. I don't get credit for them, but it's certainly a way to obtain information, okay? So Patrick, in his state in New York, he has to renew his license every th three years, but it's 36 credits that he has to do. Uh, let's see, do I offer CEUs for amputee? No, and the, and the main reason, guys, I, at, at the beginning when I first started the show, I actually did want to do um, a course for clinicians about amputee care and do an entire course. Unfortunately, I learned very quickly that it is an absolute nightmare to try to get your courses accredited through our professional organizations um, and definitely way more than just a one person job, which is what I am. That being said, um, I am there's another organization out there that I can't quite let the cat out of the bag just yet but they're also working on trying to help bring some CEU courses in. And that's really meant to be done, I think, at a, at a level where you have an organization doing it because it is a lot of work to get a course accredited. Um, and that's kind of the golden ticket right there. Uh, Kay said, I had to petition my state to take the credits and that's what happens a lot. Uh, let's see. Yes, and Justine, definitely. I mean, you you may not get credit for it, but there is nothing to, there's no reason why you cannot take uh, some of the prosthetist courses. And guys, even some, I'm thinking the one, the one company that comes to mind right now is Oser. You know, if you go on their website, and most, a lot of companies do this, a lot of the manufacturing companies have continuing education courses available for prosthetists. I know they need to get them for PTs. Hey, can we get on that? Um, but in the meantime, you have access to this knowledge and you can learn about the prosthetic componentry and, and just more on the updates taking those courses. 
No, I, I've got a little ways to go to teach that course myself, Patrick, but thank you for that. Hey, Jennifer, so glad you could make it. All right, thank you, Robin, for posting that link up there. Catherine says, Northwestern University also does a course that is put on hold from COVID, but I bet it will be back next year. Catherine, I have not heard about that course, so if you could please send me information about that course, I would very much like to learn more about it. So please, 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 Catherine, if you can send me a link or information about that, that would be phenomenal. Patrick, I am a nerd. Huh. So Kay says, her, her as well. <laughs> um, yes, I will be happy. Justine, actually, can you send me a text mess or a message to um, remind me to tell you the names of these books? And I will be more than happy to send there. Uh, Andrea says, another one of my occupational therapists, Brooks Rehab has a course in July in Jacksonville, Florida. Andrea, can you please post that information or send it to me in an email? And I'll be happy to post all of this information up here, guys. I knew I was right in asking you guys, because I know people, we all hear about these different courses and this is wonderful. Um, oh, Patrick, that's very kind. Very kind. Yeah, nerds rule. <laughs> so, you know, showing some love out there for my clinicians. All right, guys, here's another good one. All right, so here we have Kenny. Kenny asks, <laughs> hi, Cozy, hope you had a good run. Yeah, I posted my uh, video this morning before I had my run. Uh, Kenny says, I am a below the knee amputee coming up on a year in July and went to the beach for the first time last Sunday. In the water, I felt like I had both legs again. See, guys, that's why you get to get back to doing these things. Great feeling to feel whole again. Have you had any experience with Martin Bionic Socketless Socket? Talked with them and it looks and sounds pretty cool. I'm in Virginia, closest facilities in your area. Any information or thoughts would be appreciated. See you tonight, same bad time, same bad channel. So guys, here are my thoughts on, and again, this is my general umbrella recommendation for sockets. And this is something that you need to have a conversation with your prosthetist and your physical therapist to determine what works for you. For my fresh amputees, those are those are the folks who are just out of surgery, just being fit for their very first socket. I like to recommend trying the traditional socket first. That's just my umbrella recommendation. Reason is, is because most prosthetists, like 100% of prosthetists are trained in making traditional sockets. That is the most common socket that you will see, okay? And because in that first year, your limb is under gonna go is going to undergo so many different changes that you're going to be changing in and out of sockets. Now, some of these socketless socketless systems that we're seeing come out right now, and I will have to say I am not as familiar with the Martin Bionic socket guys, so I'm only speaking about what I've heard in the community about the particular socket. I've heard that the folks who use it are very happy with the product. Um, that being said, you need to make sure that you are with a prosthetist who has been trained by the company to make that particular socket. It's different from making a traditional socket. So whenever you're looking at uh, you know, an out of the box socket, something that's not the traditional socket, make sure that your prosthetist has had that specialty training. And don't be shy to ask them, ask them, how many of these sockets have you made? Okay. And then really dive into the whys and what's behind it. Why is it that you want a socketless socket? Okay. Why is it that you don't want the traditional socket? Okay. What works for one person, guys, is not going to work for the other. There is no one size fits all. And I have to put it on me. That's the onus is on me right now because I do need to learn a little bit more about some of these newer sockets that are coming out in this technology. Um, so again, talk to your prosthetist. See what is it that you're being limited in with your traditional socket that you feel that your socketless socket might provide for you. Okay, and yes, we do have a facility here in Tampa uh, that recently opened, and it's uh, I, I do know of the prosthetist who works in that clinic, and she's a phenomenal prosthetist. Um, so, Kenny, you're definitely researching in the right area and asking the right person the right questions about this. Okay, so again, ask yourself what is it that you want to be able to do in your life, and can the socketless socket help you with those particular items? And that's how you start that conversation. Okay. But yes, I've heard several people who've had um, these, uh, I, I call them a little more avant-garde sockets, and they're very happy with them. They're happy with the adjustability. All right, let me just kind of flip through here, make sure I didn't freeze again. Guys, can you just guys give me a quick thumbs up and let me know if you can still hear me because this connection has been a little bit crazy this evening. 
All right, let's move on to the next question. Oh, here's a good one. Okay, so guys, at least once every show, I get a question about skin health, skin fitness, skin integrity, and I love answering these questions because if your skin's not healthy, then terrible pun, you don't have a leg to stand on, right? If your skin is not healthy and happy with you, uh, then you're not going to be able to put that socket on. So I have no problems <laughs> answering these questions on more than one occasion. Thank you guys for giving me the heads up there. Mark, are you sticking your tongue out at me? I'm going to pinch it. That's what I do to my kids. If they stick their tongue out at me, they get their tongue pinched. All right. <laughs> so here we go. Uh, Jean asks, I am heading out to Georgia this weekend. I expect sweating in my liner. I got the Vital Fit products and we'll test them out now. I have any, do you have any suggestions for irritation of my skin from the rim of my socket? I have a knit right AK brim sheath, but it does not seem to work for me. So Jean, whenever I see that there is skin irritation, okay, that means that there is friction, right? There is something there that is rubbing up on that leg that is causing the irritation. Sounds like master of the obvious, right? But sometimes we overlook the obvious and we try to add things on to try to provide a solution for this irritation and we're actually adding more things so in the case that in your case gene in adding that knit right sheath okay you're basically adding another layer that can possibly create friction okay so again is it something that you shouldn't try no go ahead and try it obviously for you it didn't work okay so the next step would be gene uh, a go to your prosthetist okay it could be that your prosthetist sees something on that trim line that they can fix and adjust and that can give you a little bit of relief and that's kind of the trick there is where can you provide relief in the area okay is it the liner does the liner need to be trimmed just a little bit is the liner getting stretched out because if the liner is getting stretched out it's going to start rolling down it's going to start rubbing up on the skin and causing uh right around that area it's going to cause like that little pimply rash that you'll see a little bit almost like a heat rash chafing right so take a look at those things and see if that's what's causing it but yes when it comes to and guys I practice what I preach with my own patients. I recommend the Vital Skin product line. Um, I was actually having a conversation today with a dermatologist who's going to try out these products. Um, these are products that were designed for folks who wear prosthetic devices. Okay, there's a lot of skin products out there on the market, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots. Okay, and good products, right? But not necessarily products that were designed for people whose skin is under a cover all day long okay with all the problems with sweat so gene in your case i think where is it the liquid to powder lotion has been a game changer for a lot of my patients so gene in your case i would probably try to remove that knit right sheath okay because if it's not helping you get rid of it talk to your prosthetist see if there's anything in that trim line that can be adjusted a little bit and then using the liquid to powder lotion right on that area, okay? And guys, I know that's a common problem, so I would love to hear your comments right now. How do you resolve the issue when you have irritation on the brim of your socket? Now's your chance. I'm gonna have some coffee while you guys make some of those comments. Okay, so Robin says that she rubs Aquaphor on the skin at the edge of the liner trim line. And Aquaphor is a really great, Patricia says she uses the liquid to powder, okay? Uh, hey, late person, glad you could join us there, Susan. Okay, what else do you guys do? And guys, I've used Aquaphor in the past um, with some of my patients. Um, and on the edges, I think it's okay. The only time I have a problem with Aquaphor is if you're putting it on on the bottom part of your residual limb just because then it creates like an oil slick and the liner sl starts to slide off so Kay likes the liquid to powder guys i do have a discount code so if you guys want to try out these products go to my website you can order them there uh okay all right what else guys i'm putting you guys on the spot So soon, the question is for people who get a little bit of an irritation around the rim of their socket, what are some of the techniques that you guys use to help with that? 
Okay, and again, guys, whenever there's any kind of irritation of skin, okay, it's finding the source of the problem, finding out what's causing that skin to be irritated. And nine times out of 10, it's some sort of friction or shearing force. So Susan uses a little bit of coconut oil. And again, with my patients on around the edge, the top edge of their brim, I tend to relax a little bit more. I'm more strict about the skin on the actual residual limb, about what they put on it, and more specifically what they don't put on it. Um, but around the edge of the skin, it, you know, because of that irritation. Okay, so a lot of liquid to powder lotions here and coconut oil. Sounds good, guys. And then to follow up on that question, Jennifer asks, what lotion do you recommend for my right below the knee? Drum roll, please. Okay. And again, guys, this is stuff that I've used on myself. I practice, I, I, whenever companies send me products, I try them out on myself. I use myself as the guinea pig. Uh, to see if things work. And for me, the, the testimony, the, the, the true test of a good lotion is one that can soak in quickly and that doesn't sweat out. Does that make sense, guys? Especially in those of y'all who live in Florida, you know exactly what I'm talking about, where you put some lotion on in the morning, you walk outdoors and you feel like a slime ball because it just like slimed out of you. Okay. So again, one of these things I like about this particular line soaks in nicely doesn't leave an oil slick on your skin, you can put your liner on top of this, okay? Now, granted, in the summertime with some of my patients, they may not use the daytime moisturizer, especially on our really, really high humidity days, super high, but the nighttime is absolutely wonderful. It just kind of nourishes the skin and kind of gets it ready for the next day. Um, and yes, I have no problems with things like coconut oil, um, things like Aquaphor, uh, for nighttime use when it's when the when your liner is not on your skin okay the thing to consider with some of these products guys is sometimes they don't soak in all the way so the next morning you have to either take a shower or clean your residual limb to get the residue off that's my recommendation there Okay, so Robin says the liquid powder didn't work for her. Uh, let's see. Denise says I had occasional irritation that went away when I started using Vital Fit. Uh, Glenda says liquid to powder was a lifesaver in 110 degree heat. Okay, so guys, we got we got uh, answers all across the board here. Okay, so a couple of different options to choose from. All right, this question, and this is a question um, that was sent to me. Um, so a a mom reached out to me. And she said, you know, my 18 year old son is a left above the knee amputee due to osteosarcoma. And I know we have a lot of osteosarcoma survivors on my show, which is unusual because osteosarcoma actually represents a very small percentage of the amputee population. So um, hopefully this person is listening right now. Uh, he received physical therapy and he's been receiving physical therapy with for very consistently for a year. And he's going to start college this fall on campus and is still not walking, willing to walk for exercise. And the only time he walks is when he's going to his appointments or during physical therapy. He's working out consistently at home, but I'm concerned about the needs for additional walking to build up stamina. Okay. And guys, you know, it, it, it's been, it's been a minute since I went off to college and I know for many of you, but I, I remember, I remember very clearly the summer before uh, heading off to college and that anticipation and that excitement and the nervousness and, and the you know bundle of nerves associated with heading off on that new chapter in your life. And, you know, I, I cannot imagine having such a life-changing event such as having an amputation, such as having cancer, you know, right when you're in that transition, that important transition in your life. Um, I'm no psychologist. I am no psychiatrist. I am a mother of four and I am a cancer survivor myself. So I'm speaking from that perspective right now. Um, so two things, this is actually something that happens a lot with many of my own patients where I am working them to the bone with physical therapy. And I know <laughs> that I'm doing well by them. I know that they're working hard. They're making gains on their strength, their range of motion, their balance, their coordination. We are there, right? And as graduation time approaches, my patients are very hesitant sometimes to take that leap of faith, right? To they'll walk up and down in my clinic, no hands out of the parallel bars, but then when I ask them about walking in the community, 
there's always an excuse. So quick cozy poll, quick cozy poll. How many of you did this happen to? That was probably not very good grammar. How many of you experienced this? How many of you experienced going through the therapy, right? And you know that you're ready to be out there and start going out there in the community and you clammed up. And it took you a long time to finally get that first outing under your belt with your prosthesis, without a walker, without crutches. Show of hands. I want to know. Actually, Jody, you can use the powder on the inside of your liner. It's actually meant to go directly on your skin and you can use it with your liner on top. Oh, Dick Devers, happy birthday. And my pleasure. Okay, Patricia says it's happening to her right now. Jennifer says me. Okay, so guys, keep posting those comments there because again, if this individual is watching, I want him to see that he's not alone in this. Okay, so here's the thing. There's two things that I've noticed in my experience as a physical therapist. During that time, it's either due to one of two things, physical or emotional, and sometimes both. Okay. Sometimes even as a physical therapist, I get my horse blinders on and I'm just like, okay, this patient needs to work on their balance, 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 balance. And then I miss on the fact that they're still needing a little bit more on their strengthening or the opposite. I'm working focused on glute strength, glute strength, glute strength, glute strength, and their balance kind of, okay. So we get to that point where they're getting ready to head out in the community and my patients will tell me, no, I don't feel secure. I don't feel safe. I feel unsteady. Okay. So for me as a therapist, the first thing I do is I give them a head to toe evaluate, re-evaluation, re-assessment where I go, okay, let's make sure I didn't miss anything. I'm human. It happens. Right? So I do a head to toe evaluation. And if I see, yep, you know what? You still have a weakness in this muscle group. And that's why you feel unsteady. That's why you don't feel confident enough to get out there and walk. It's because there is a physical limitation there that we need to address and tidy up. Okay. As a patient, you may not know why you feel unsteady. You're not going to be able to say, oh, it's because my glute medius is, is a three out of five strength. No, that's our job as clinicians, right? So that would be my first recommendation to the mom of this young man is to say, talk to the physical therapist, the fact that they've been seeing him for a whole year. Okay. Sometimes they need to do a reassessment and just see where they're at. And then there's the psychological part of recovery. And this is something that I do advocate for a lot on the show, guys, physical, spiritual, and emotional recovery. Those are the three tenets for me of a successful recovery from any kind of a trauma or crisis. Okay. And during this time, it's the, oh my gosh, this is my new body. How do I get back out there in the community? How do I do this? How do I do this? And this is something that I've coached a lot of my patients through. And because of the nature of my practice, sometimes I'm actually able to do it with them in the community. And the first thing I usually tell people is the grocery store, right? We all have to go to the grocery store. We all have to get groceries and we all have usually one grocery store that we go to. And we know usually where we park, we know our way to get there. And that's usually my first homework assignment for my patients is park and get yourself to the front of that grocery store. And especially if you have the handicap access parking spot, it'll be 500 feet. And it doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to be smooth. It doesn't even have to be efficient. It just has to get you there. You just have to get from your car to the entrance of that store. Make it happen, right? So here we go. Yes. And Andrea, that was going to be my next part of it, guys. The Amputee Coalition. Okay. We've had them on the show on more than one occasion. I did a show with them with Vital Fit about a week ago. Okay. This organization is a game changer in many, many ways. It did not, it, it, it was just a, a little bit of a whisper of an organization uh, when I first started out. And now it's something that I recommend to all my patients. Okay. That emotional support. The MPT Coalition has a nationwide network of support groups that you can look up by your zip code. And then the number two feature is their certified peer visitor program. If you're not someone who really wants to be in a support group, that's understandable. If you're more of a one-on-one -on -one person, the certified peer visitor, they have such a huge bank of trained peer visitors 
that they can match you up to your ge geographical location and also even close to your age range, right? Because for this young man who's starting college, he's going to best relate to another young man who's either in his late teens or early 20s. And they can try to match you up with someone like that so that you can see you're not alone in that process and how they got through it, okay? Uh, Susan, see, David says it's truly a work in progress. And it is, it is. And, it, and for me, I actually gave a talk on this uh, at the last Mission Gate organization, Discover Your Possible Event. It was all about this gray area, the area between getting towards the end of your traditional rehab and physical therapy and getting out there in the community. And for me, I call it the rip off the band-aid moment. If I know that my patient is physically capable and safe of getting out there, I'm like, okay, let's rip off that band-aid and let's get you out there. Let's get you out there, right? Uh, Jean says, I certainly limit where I go. Praise God, I have, have I have help to encourage me. And guys, it's it's taking those baby steps. You're not gonna do, you're not gonna go from zero to 60 in, in one week. You know, so going back to my example of the grocery store, I'll tell my folks, just make it to the entrance of the grocery store. After that, you can grab the shopping cart and hang on to that for dear life, okay? But just get to the grocery, the entrance of the grocery store. That is your one victory. That is the one thing that I assigned my patient to do that week. The other thing is church, okay? The days that I worked home health, that was a question that we had to ask our patients in the initial patient interview. Do you wish to go back to your place of worship? Do you have a place of worship? And most of my patients, eight out of 10 patients usually said, yeah, you know, I like to go to church on Sundays. Okay, so let's map that out. You know, again, the handicap access parking spot is a godsend when you go to the church and determining where's the closest door that you have to go to. And just have a chair waiting for you at that door with, from a loved one who's with you. And you just got to walk that little distance and just get yourself to church. <laughs> okay. And once you do that, it's you know, repetition, repetition, repetition. And you start to learn how to troubleshoot these little obstacles that will get in your way. You start to learn that, hmm, that's the curb that I don't like. If I just move down an extra foot here, I can negotiate this part of the curb and get myself into that building. No shame in that. Or I know I need to get to the church 15 minutes early to beat the rush, right? And get there so that I can comfortably walk to my chair and not feel like I have too much of the crowd around me. Okay? So guys, there's a way to do it. Learn the, the whole, where there's a will, there's a way. There's a way to do it. And for someone like this young man who is going off to a new adventure in college, meeting new people and adjusting to his new body and what that looks like, okay? To me, it's especially important for someone like him to get out there. <laughs> and in terms of the endurance with the walking, that will come with getting out there little by little and just having that support. You can't do it without the support. You know, man is an island. You can't do this by yourself. And I'm, I'm hearing this repeated here in the comment section here. Okay, Susan says, I couldn't wait to get out. Glenda says, it's still not there. Susan says, I use a cane, probably always will. And that's fine, guys. There are some folks that come into my clinic that when I do the evaluation on them and I realize, yes, they will have to utilize some form of assistive device. And there is nothing wrong with that. To me, having the ability uh, to have access to a cane or a walker, that's going to give you your independence. If walking without an assistive device is not something that's feasible for you, okay, the cane and the walker don't see that as a limitation. I see that as that's your ticket to independence. That's what's going to keep you safe in the community so that you can go about and get into the community. Okay. There we go. Andrea just said it. Peer visitor with a college student at the same level. Mark asks, do you do the assessment by just watching the patient? No. No. Well, I mean, yes, Mark. There's, there's definitely when it comes to the gait analysis part of it, it's me parked in my chair watching my patient walk up and down and dissecting all the little parts about their gait. Um, but no, it, it, it is a literal head to toe examination where I will examine the range of motion of the different joints in their body. I'm going to examine the muscle strength of each of the individual muscle groups, because as we're working with patients and we get into the more advanced, um, you know, treatment techniques and we're working with several muscle groups at the same time, for example, there could be one muscle group that's weak and you're not going to see it unless you go looking for it. 
Okay. So, you know, sometimes with certain treatments, you got to stop what you're doing and say, okay, something here isn't working. Let's go back to the drawing board, do a quick reassessment and see if we can spot something that's jumping out at us. Uh, Kay says going to the college would be tough with showers, roommates, etc. Maybe they have an occupational therapist help with a really streamlined bathroom routine. Okay, that's something else to consider. You know, what is the dorm situation going to look like? And nowadays, guys, you know, there, there's so much more awareness now than there was just 20 years ago. It's not perfect. And I know we still have a ways to go with that. Um, but just creating an environment that feels safe and secure where he can maneuver in his own environment. And again, getting out there in the community. Okay. And Susan says, I have a psychological problem when it comes to anything but walking. I get nervous about things like sledding or doing other things than walking and fear of hurting myself. And, you know, guys, that's a perfectly reasonable fear. I think even if you have two anatomical legs, you know, for me, the thought I've, I've never been snow skiing. I've never been skiing on snow before in my life. And I'm a fairly adventurous person. And, you know, the thought of learning how to ski at my age now versus when I was 20 years old, it does make me a little bit nervous. Why? Because I know it can hurt if I get injured. <laughs> I know that some of these injuries can be pretty severe, you know, so it's, it's taking things in perspective, guys, and saying, you know, what is it that is missing in my life right now that I want to be able to do? And how can I take that thing, whether it's going to the grocery store by yourself, whether it's going to the park, whether it's going to church, and how can I break it down into small bite-sized pieces and tackle that one bit at a time? Okay, and this is definitely where you see me. This is my physical therapist brain coming out. And I know my occupational therapists are also in the same, in the same brain loop. You know, as, as, as therapists, we don't see, uh, you know, the task as a whole. Okay, we see the starting point, we see the end point, and then we figure out what are the small pieces we need to get there. That's how we construct our plans for our patients. Okay, both in the clinic and for me outside of the clinic. Yeah. How do my clin clinicians, I want you guys chiming in on this one. Help me out here. Oh, Michelle, very, that is a very hot Washington. I'm glad you could join us though. Ooh, Andrea, let's talk. Can you send me a message about the college above the knee peer visitor in Florida? Can you uh, send me that information after the show, please? Uh, let's see. Kenny says, I had a kidney pancreas transplant 27 years ago. Now the, the below the knee as of July 2020, and my motto is don't ever give up. I have a very dear friend of mine who is constantly reminding me not to give up before you get to the finish line. So Pat says, I use Adapt Skin on the occasional hot spots in the groin area, still deal with sweat in the liner on warm temperatures. As a track and field official, I've gone back to using a Velcro waist belt to keep the leg from pistoning while at a meet. Also need to take the leg off and dry the residual limb from time to time, and we'll try Vital Fit product and see if that helps. Great, Pat. And Pat, grab the uh, COSI 10. Here, I'll put it on again grab the discount code. So if you want to try out the products, just grab one of their travel size kits and you can get it for 10 bucks and see what, what do you like? Okay. Let's see. A lot of great comments coming in. Uh, <laughs> trying to get to these comments. Oh, Bobby, thanks for joining us in. And yes, guys, I don't know for those of you, I, I, I never got to meet Larry Bainham in person, but I heard wonderful things about him and he did come onto the show a lot to watch the show. So he passed away. Um, after a long, long battle with illness. Um, so yeah, for those of you who knew Larry, uh, Patricia says, if you're working with a physical therapist, would you ask them to do a head to toe assessment if they have not completed that? So Patricia, I call them the head to toe assessments, but that's not the official term. It's basically just a physical therapy evaluation. And whenever you walk, whenever you step foot into a physical therapy clinic, your very first visit with your physical therapist is exactly that. It's, it's a physical therapy evaluation. And much like doctors, PTs all have their different ways of doing it. Some PTs are a little bit more thorough than others. Um, I've learned over the years that the more thorough I am, the more I can pick up and head off problems down the line, even if it takes me, sometimes it might take me the first two visits with my patient to really get that full assessment done. Um, and then as I'm working with my patient, Patricia, 
I'm always reassessing my patient in my brain. Like that's just how our brains, that's how we are trained as clinicians. Um, and, and that was certainly drilled into me in my very early days in internship where my clinical instructors would say, okay, your patient's coming in for treatment number three. Are you going to continue doing the same exercises from treatment number two, or do you advance your patient? And the only way you're going to know if you're advancing your patient is you're reassessing their abilities again. Okay. So Patricia, it's something that you can certainly ask your therapist and say, Hey, you know, when you did that first evaluation on me, what did my muscle strength show? What deficiencies or what deficits did I present with? Okay. Guys, I've had my fair share of physical therapy treatments for myself. I have two PTs that help keep Humpty Dumpty together. Um, so whenever I have something going on and I go see my own physical therapist, I, I try my best to keep my mouth shut, which is, you know, hard for me to do. Um, but then after they're done assessing me, I'll ask them, all right, what'd you find? Let's talk about it. And that's something that your physical therapist should be talking to you about so that they can show you the whys behind the treatment plan. Okay. Uh, so Robin says, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, osteosarcoma survivor, and above the knee amputee. I would round up a few of his buddies and encourage them to get him out there and perhaps out from under the wing of his partners. So maybe if possible, I would take a road trip for an afternoon to the college campus to preempt any anticipatory issues. That's a fantastic idea. Um, because of my career, why not get aligned with a good therapist now to deal with the trauma? Just a few quick thoughts, and I have many. And guys, this is where, when I worked in a hospital, this is why I loved working with the social workers. This is why, because I'm obviously not a trained psychologist or psycho psychiatrist um, or a mental health worker. So everything that she's saying is spot on. Okay. And sometimes it's the fear of the unknown, right guys? If, if you really kind of think about it and it boils down to, it's the fear of the unknown. It's the fear of, I don't know what's going to be here between my car and the entrance of that grocery store. Okay. I don't know what's going to happen to me as I try to walk into that first pew at church. I don't know what I'm going to encounter when I set foot on my brand new college campus. So just going and having that preparation and like Robin said, getting out there with a couple of really supportive buddies and checking out the place before the first day of school even starts, right? <laughs> uh, oh, Susan says, I would never ski, but only because of my amputation. I'm Canadian, so of course I want to do winter things, but won't, will hurt myself. I'm clumsy. And Susan, I would encourage you to look up some of these adaptive sport organizations. Um, we've had several of the folks watching this show today um, that they learned how to ski after their amputations, right? So if it's something that you truly miss and truly want to do, do a little bit of research. There are many ways that are safe uh, to learn how to do these adaptive sports um, and, and, and in, a, in a safe environment where you have the instructors there to teach you how to do this in a safe way. So I, I wouldn't close the door on that. Go ahead and then do this. It's a Google search away, right? Google search away. Thank you, Jean. Yep, little by little, Patrick. How do you eat an elephant? <laughs> little by little. It's exactly that. It's exactly that. Hey, Vicky, glad you could join in. Uh, CK says, yep, breaking into the steps that can be accomplished successfully. And Patrick says, always think progression as a physical therapist. So guys, you're going to see this. See, my fellow clinicians are chiming in and helping me out here. So, you know, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. How do you get to that goal? One small step at a time. And you put the pieces of the puzzle together until you get to the end. And again, you can't do this by yourself, guys. You can't. Y you need the help, whether it's the help of a clinician who's helping figure out what physical deficits you still need to work on, or if it's the, the emotional help uh, that you need from your buddies to take you out for a beer so that you can lose that fear of getting out there into the community, right? Uh, yeah, unknown is definitely scary. Okay, Sportable. Yes, that's a great adaptive sports organization located in Richmond, Virginia. And guys, if, if, you, were to, if you were to kind of Google search adaptive sports near me, you're going to start to find so much more guys, so much more than what we had um, just even five years ago. All right. We're doing great with the questions. I love this. All right. Mm -hmm. Hang on guys. 
I want to make sure I get everything. Ooh, this one. Uh, this one comes in from Matthew. Matthew asks, I have heard that some amputees have a shower leg. Uh, does that mean that they actually wear an old leg in the shower? I'm a right below the knee amputee two and a half years out from surgery. Okay. Uh, so guys, yes and no. So shower leg means basically they just wear their leg in the shower. And, you know, I, I actually, can we do another cozy poll? How many of y'all, if you don't mind putting in the comment section, whether you wear your leg in the shower or you don't wear your leg in the shower, can y'all put post that into the section right there? I see kind of an 50, 50 among my patients. Um, half of my patients decide to use a shower chair so that they can sit down and remove the prosthesis and that way they can really easy for them to wash the residual limb. And I have some folks that they have, these are more my younger folks, uh, that they will stand in the shower on the one leg and kind of lean up on the wall and, you know, do all their hygiene that they need to do. And then there's some folks that they wear their shower leg in the shower because they like the, the, the idea of standing on two legs while they're taking their shower. And then what they do is they make sure that they take their leg off at some point to wash the full residual limb. All right. So let's see what, let's see what survey says. Uh, Susan uses a shower bench. Mark says no leg. Bobby says he wears it. Harsh does not. Jody does not. Pat, no. So the overwhelming that they don't. Kenny does the shower leg. Uh, bath in the tub, no leg. Okay. K is an AK. So shower bench and lots of crab rails. Yes. Uh, I, Lonnie says, take it off. Use a shower leg. So guys, when it comes to this, to me, it's, it's, it's a, it's a safety decision first. Okay. So what, what is going to be the most safe option for my patient? For some of my patients, I say, nope, you need a shower chair. You need to be sitting down because your balance, we don't want you falling in the shower. No bueno. Right grab rails, the whole nine yards. And then I have some patients that they have excellent balance and I leave it up to them to decide, do they want to walk into the shower with their prosthesis on, or do they go in with their crutches and they, they shower standing up on the one leg. And again, this is also where the occupational therapist comes in really handy because they know a lot of techniques on how they can do this in a safe way. Now, if you do decide that you want to wear a prosthesis into the shower, usually what people will do is they will save an old socket, right? And they'll just put a cheap foot on the end of it, either in the form of like a cheap satch foot and one of these wooden feet from, from the way back when that, you know, they really don't cost a lot of money. Uh, some people will get a water foot. And the one that always comes to mind is the uh, breeze foot by College Park, where it's again, very inexpensive foot and it has a drain hole at the bottom where all the water can run out. It can be used at the beach, it can be used at the pool. Uh, another favorite of mine for shower options and beach options and pool options is the Sidekicks foot. It's a stubby foot also made by College Park. Um, a stubby foot, it's, it looks like a, like a little rectangle and it has tire tread on the bottom and it has movement. The, the, the uh, Sidekicks one actually has movement in the ankle, um, which some of the other stubby feet don't have. So these are some of the options that you might have. Now, I do have to put this in there because, you know, it's me. If you are going to be wearing your shower leg into the shower, okay, at some point, your leg needs to come off and water needs to go on the entire part of your residual limb. That is the way to get rid of all the bacteria, all the germs, all the sweat, all the grime that's been collecting there all day long, okay? And at some point in your day, your, your leg needs to be open to air to breathe, Okay. So, you know, a lot of, many of you have your nighttime routines where you take your leg off and that's it. It's done for the evening. If you have to get up, you use your crutches or your walker. Okay. And this is good guys. It allows your skin to breathe and relax. And if you have the ability to put on one of these little lotions on to get that skin healthy and recuperated for the next day of wearing the prosthesis, especially for those of you who wear it for eight, 10, 12, 14 hours a day. Okay. Uh, let's see. So Jean says, no, it's easier to take a bath. Roisin says, sit in a shower chair, but I'd love to stand up. Uh, Patricia says, don't have a shower leg. And then again, some of you may not have a shower leg either because you're still wearing your initial socket or because maybe your old socket was really not fitting well. So sometimes we folks don't have that option. Mm -hmm. Mark says, I use my original leg and foot for swimming and diving. Uh, Davison says, I have a waterproof prosthetic cover. Okay. 
Uh, let's see, Barbara's an AK, you, no prosthesis, swivel chair, and a lot of grab bars. Okay. So guys, there's, there's a lot of kind of different options out there for you. Again, safety first. We don't need any falls in the shower because those hurt. <laughs> and then after that, you know, what feels good, right? If you like to stand up in the shower, then either go in with your crutches or go in with your leg. And if you prefer to sit down and take your time, then use the shower chair. Uh, the two shower feet, Justine, and again, these aren't the only options. There's other options out there, but College Park makes something called the Breeze Foot. That's their water one that has, again, super inexpensive, nothing fancy. Water drains out the bottom, okay? And then the Sidekicks, which is kind of one of my top five favorites when it comes to feet in general. The Sidekicks Stubby Foot. Um, again, it's got a nice tire tread on the bottom to prevent the slipping. And it has move movement in the ankle itself, which most stubby, actually, I think it's the only, I can, saw, I can hmm, say that it's the only stubby foot out there on the market that it has movement in the ankle. Um, and again, Okay, looks like I'm back and I'm back. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jody. Yeah, I think, uh, <laughs> oh, this Florida weather. Love being a one man production crew, but you know, show must go on, right, guys? All right, well, those were basically all the questions I had for this evening, guys. Um, thank you again. And guys, I am trying my best to grow uh, some certain platforms that I have right now. If you're not already following me on Instagram and on YouTube, I am easy to find. I am under Cozy Talks. If you don't mind, take a moment after the show is over. Follow me on Instagram. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. A lot of these things are going to be growing a lot more. Uh, a lot of good stuff on my YouTube channel already. A lot of these great videos. So if you can, please uh, subscribe, follow me there. It helps me grow the platform. Um, so guys, I will be seeing you. Uh, same bad time, same bad channel next week. If I missed your question, please don't be shy. Send me an email. I answer all of my emails within one or two business days and find the answers for you. All right, guys, thank you for letting me be a part of your lives this evening. I have really enjoyed tonight's discussion. And thank you for those of you uh, who contributed those answers and to help this young man. Uh, hopefully get to that next step in his life. All right, guys, we will see you next week.